Welcome to the Ghosts of Plum Run Hour on Midwestern Marks. I'm Tim Russo, author of the Star Wars series for leftists, Ghosts of Plum Run. Uh, welcome to the podcast, audiobook of chapter two. Today we have a, or a volume two, uh, Serpents and Dust. Um, today we have a special uh, edition, a reading from volume one, Beginnings, because um, our fearless leader on Midwestern Marks, Eddie Liger-Smith, uh, wrote a great article on MidwesternMarks.com entitled American Slavery and Global Capitalism. And in that article, which is getting shared and republished quite a bit in a few places, uh, he really makes the argument I try to make throughout this series. Um, and it begins with uh, the price of labor for cotton uh, throughout the coloni colony period of... Uh, the American South, slavery, all of that, uh, the price of labor for cotton was basically zero. And if you paid any labor costs for cotton in that period, your cotton didn't sell. So this percolated up throughout the entire world economy. And um, in our series about the charge of the first Minnesota at Gettysburg, uh, I studied uh, the history of all of the soldiers in Company A, which was situated next to the colors during the charge on July 2nd, 1863. And one of the people uh, grew up in Rhode Island. One of the men in the in Company A, 1st Minnesota, grew up in Rhode Island, which was uh, captured by uh, the cotton economy. And uh, his name is Rosellus Maori, uh, private, uh, wounded in the charge, survived, made it. Uh, made it to a very long life. In in fact, there are photographs of him at the 1897 reunion dedication of the monument to the first Minnesota's charge, which you can see still there today. Uh, Rosellus Maori, there's not a whole lot known about uh, his life, so this is all fiction, what I added onto his life. Um, I have not looked at Maori's uh, pension file in um, the National Archives, so uh, there is some information there that I haven't looked at, largely about his wound, so that he could get his pension. Uh, apparently, he uh, describes his wound in detail, uh, but I have not looked at that. What I did was try and go back into Maui's mind as a child growing up in Rhode Island and how uh, the no labor cost price of cotton affected uh, Rosellus Maui's family. So we go from this. Uh, part of the book of volume one where we introduce Rosellus Maori. And then in volume two, uh, we go we, we go back to Maori where he is with the regiment on its way to Gettysburg at Uniontown and has a nightmare referring to uh, the story that I'm about to tell. So let's get into it. Chapter four, Rosellus Maori, uh, volume one, beginnings of Ghosts of Plum Run. Let's get going. A clock ticks in Rhode Island. Rhode Island was so filled with Maoris by 1848, anyone without the same, anyone without the name had all sorts of other names for them. Silver Spoon, Blue Blood, Silk Stockings, Patrician, Aristocrat, The Landed. Little Rosellus Maori had heard them all. The family homestead in Smithfield teemed with Maori children constantly. When the kids weren't helping farm the plot, racing around chasing each other or in school, Rosellus' father, Zeba, and mother, Everline, gathered them round to tell the tales of the colonial patriarch Nathaniel, arriving on this spot in any number of legendary ways in 1660-something. The tales varied based on who told them. Mama's version had Nathaniel's father getting exiled into the wilderness from Plymouth Colony for being some sort of heretic. Papa's version featured Nathaniel's father's arrival on the English ship Blessing in 1635, after which Nathaniel, Nathaniel entered the world in 1644 somehow. Aunt Esther's story, which she never failed to tell on Christmas Eve from a rocking chair, was the best one. Rosellus and his four, four brothers gathered. Aunt Esther spun such a yarn about Nathaniel, he seemed to seemed godlike, hacking his family's birthright from the wilderness with his bare hands. The second youngest, by seven years old, in 1848, Rosellus had already had enough. It was Sunday school that turned the worm. One Sunday, some holy man declared to the assembled children that by saying a certain prayer in precisely the same way at a certain time of day, some certain percentage of the Holy Spirit's miraculous power would accrue unto the devoted. So Rosellus, being good with math and a kid, started adding it all up. 
figuring after saying this prayer correctly for a while, he could perform any miracle he chose. After five Sundays of saying this particular prayer at the perfect time in the perfect way, Rosellas calculated it was time to bend a spoon on the table by directing the Holy Spirit's power at it with his stare. The spoon didn't bend, of course. That summer day, Rosellas decided everyone in the Maori family was a liar and a fraud. Over autumn, the family began to notice Rosellas brewed, shorter to anger, descending into books and especially maps. When Aunt Esther told her colonial tales Christmas Eve, 1848, Rosellas sat at the base of the Christmas tree staring at a map of the frontier beyond the Mississippi River. Calling the children one by one to her lap, Aunt Esther rocked them along, as usual. And what do all the Maori children want for Christmas this year, she would ask. At his turn, Rosellas pointed a finger onto his map, randomly landing onto the word Minnesota. Rosellas was the only soul of 200 years of Maoris in Smithfield that, with that given name. He hated it. By summer 1849, at eight years old, while Peter March choked on cotton dust in exile in Liverpool from his revolutionary uh, adventures, and Millie learned to play violin in St. Paul, he'd come to prefer Rassel. Rassel's father, Zebra, Zeba, was the only the second Maori with his name, after his own father, Zeba Sr. Thus, father, son, and grandpa were close. When, like himself, Everleen and Zeba's boy Rassel started to appear good with math, the father and son connection hardened like the masonry Zeba was known for. Miles of Stonewall and Smithfield owed their perfection to Rassel's dad, Zeba Maori Jr. To help supplement the farm, Zeba learned carpentry from Harris Steer, another far farmer on a family plot just down the road in Smithfield. From carpentry, Zeba turned to building stone walls such that not a road in Smithfield was missing a Zeba Maori wall after a while, all the way south into Greenville, where Rosellas and his brothers went to school. As soon as Rassel's hands were big enough to handle stones, Zeba took his son with him on the job as soon as school let out for the summer. Left to work on the family farm, Rassel's four brothers were, of course, jealous. Crawford, the oldest, at 13, never liked math or stones or carpentry, so he wasn't too bothered. Simon, 12, and Gilbert, 10, found adventure in the fields, but three-year-old Albert took it personally, as toddlers do. Every time Rassel headed out with Papa, Albert raised a ruckus. Albert was spoiled, largely since both of Everleen's daughters before him died early, Josephine at 11 months and Mary at 5 months. At 1849, Albert was the baby, molded into the most delicate of the Maori children. Rassel's favorite moment leaving every morning to build walls with Papa that summer was when they rounded the first bend from home to make it out of earshot of Albert's morning tantrums. Since Rassel figured out the year before that the power of the Holy Spirit wouldn't bend spoons for him no matter how much of it he accumulated with magic words whispered in just a certain way, this summer, he presented the sudden, skeptical curiosity of an eight-year-old, subjecting his father to an interrogation every single day. Cutting in some mortar between stones one afternoon, Zeba's frustration at being on Rassel's witness stand got the best of him. Why are there so many cotton mills around Smithfield? Rassel asked as Papa troweled in the mortar. Water power, Zeba's answers to Rassel's endless questions were clipped quite short by late summer. Rassel positioned another stone, then another query. But why cotton? Rassel insisted. It's cheap. Why is cotton cheap? Zeba's mortaring accelerated. You should be happy it's cheap. Zeba pressed harder and harder into the mortar, something in him becoming hot, Rassel's summer-long interrogation prying too close. But we don't make cheap stone walls, Rassel went for another stone. Someday you may own one of those mills. Why would I want to make something cheap? Rassel wondered. To feed your children, Zeba started to snap. The trowel pressed the mortar in a frenzy. Rassel placed another stone. Where do they get the cotton for all those mills? Suddenly, Zeba pressed too hard on the mortar, and the stone fell off the wall onto his foot. Damn it! Zeba hopped around in pain. Rassel rushed to his father's foot, crying with apologies. Zeba's limp on the way home eased until he'd walked it off, comforting Rassel, who thought it was all his fault for asking too many questions. Widow Tucker's Witches Living next door to the Maoris, Widow Tucker was only heard of, a rumor, a scandal ignored, a forgotten spinster to be isolated. People would take care of Widow Tucker here and there. Rassel's mom always sent him over with pie or cake at Christmas. Papa would help with odd jobs. But in autumn 1849, the chill gray wind dangling tree limbs like bony fingers from the sky, terror struck the Maori kids' hearts at the mere mention of the widow next door. They'd rush across Widow Tucker's yard on scamps through the woods between the Maori homestead and her creaky house. She was never seen, one glimpse of the house, and the boys ran for their lives. 
Around the hearth each night, they spun tales of close calls of wickedness harbored by Widow Tucker, waiting to seize little children, but for their cleverness, clever quickness at escape. One dusk that October, Rassel's older brothers Crawford, Simon, and Gilbert raced past him on the way home through Widow Tucker's front yard so quickly they didn't hear eight-year-old Rassel trip on a tree root, roll to the ground, and freeze there in a pile of leaves under which, uh, underneath which flies had gathered upon something dead. Alone, Rassel stared up at the porch as the silhouette of the witchy woman appeared in her front window still. She'd seen him. Rassel just knew it. The flies made their presence known in a cloud over Rassel. He tried to sink deeper into the leaf pile, become one with the ground, to vanish away from the flies and Widow Tucker's gaze. Both closing in, moments lingered, Rassel trapped between discovery and a host of insects. Footsteps brushed through leaves toward the house, right past him. His every hesitant inhale captured a mouth or a nose full of flies, so Rassel tried to stop breathing. The footsteps came from three ladies in black who seemed to float up the porch steps. Widow Tucker disappeared from the window. The door whined open. Flies in his ears now. Through their buzz, Rassel heard each lady repeat the same thing to Widow Tucker as they entered, like a password. Then the door closed. An oil lamp lit up the interior. Bounding to his feet, Rassel flew home so fast he barely touched the ground, waving flies off of him, hurling into leaf piles to, to roll on the ground to cleanse of them. Bolting past the Maori house to the well, Rassel pumped water over himself frank frantically. His stunned brothers ran to the well, surrounding their soaked, shivering little brother, who just stared forward, panting on the ground like a dog. She has witches, Rassel whispered, <clears throat> heaving for breath. They cast a spell of flies. Mama warmed Rassel up with a bath. Then the boy spent another dark, cold night around the hearth telling witchy tales until bedtime. Rassel couldn't fall asleep, horrified that Mama would send him to that house again with a Christmas pie, until chirping birds of the, more, of the nearing dawn finally sang him off into dreams. News that Widow Tucker had cast a spell of flies upon him took hold of Rassel's school in Greenville in no time, as kids do what kids do. By the end of November 1849, eight-year-old Rassel's part in the story had disappeared, <clears throat> Widow Tucker's legend, reaching heights only kids could conjure, so evil and otherworldly, Rassel's skeptical nature kicked in. Like learning the Holy Spirit's power would not actually empower him to bend spoons with his mind, Rassel soon figured out Widow Tucker was no witch. Turned out, everyone hated Widow Tucker, who none of them had met, guilt eating at Rassel for his part in making things worse. Quietly, Rassel started listening very closely to every yarn spun about Widow Tucker for clues. There must be some reason everyone was afraid of her. Not some witchy reason. No, a real reason. Rassel was sure of it. But it was useless. Every time Rassel thought he'd whacked past the thicket of ghoulish legend to something real, all he encountered was silence. But those three ladies, the ones who walked right by Rassel as he lay on the ground, swarmed by flies in front of Widow Tucker's house. Rassel's invest investigation turned up nothing on them either. No one knew a thing, nor wanted to. It seemed the spell was cast not by Widow Tucker, but at her. A spell of silence. For the first time, Rassel looked forward to delivering the pie Mama would bake for Widow Tucker every Christmas. He simply had to meet this witch and see for himself. As Mama was baking the usual bread one morning, one Saturday morning, late in, late in November, Rassel asked which sort of pie would go to Widow Tucker that Christmas. Papa overheard. A clue emerged in the tone of Papa's voice, the same tone Papa used when Rassel asked about cotton mills that summer. Stop sending that woman pies, Papa yelled. You'll do well to mind your own business, Mama snapped, as she needed. That night, Rassel's mind raced as he tried to sleep, imagining what answers to his questions might await him behind Widow Tucker's exile of silence, soon to be unlocked by a Christmas pie. I'm sorry we brought no Christmas pie. It's all my fault for making everyone think you're a witch. Little Rassel implored at Widow Tucker's front door one late January afternoon, so nervous and ashamed, he trembled in the winter cold. <clears throat> oh, people think I'm all sorts of things, Widow Tucker chuckled. Do come in and warm up, young man. When Christmas came and went in 1849, without Mama sending Rassel next door with the annual Christmas pie for Widow Tucker, this, his kid instinct to question kicked into high gear. Rassel sensed the, the same silent shroud Widow Tucker's existence as when he asked Papa about cotton mills. Finally, on the walk home from school one day, Rassel summoned his courage, walked past the spot in her front yard where he'd fallen last autumn under the assumed witchy spell of flies, marched right up Widow Tucker's porch stairs, and knocked, introducing himself as the boy next door. 
Now, what sort of witch was I, Mr. Mowry? Widow Tucker teased, waddling toward her kitchen to make some hot milk. You cast a spell of flies on me, Rassel confessed, relieved that humor would govern his visit. Widow Tucker burst into uproarious laughter, so persistent Rassel almost cried. I'm so sorry, Mrs. Tucker. My secret powers get better in old age, Widow Tucker joked. Do sit down. But who were those ladies, Rassel wondered. Oh, just old friends from Pawtucket, Widow Tucker replied. Very old friends. A short visit at the hearth later, hot milk downed at kid speed, Widow Tucker waved goodbye from her porch. Rassel skipped home through the snow, forgiven for his childhood ways, with a new friend. Curiosity now insatiable, Rassel kept all, the, all he learned next door to himself. Sleeping so soundly that night, he had to be dragged out of bed for school the next morning. He rushed into the tiny schoolhouse, heading straight for his teacher, knowing his new quest must be kept out of earshot of anyone at home, an instinct the teacher's shocked response to his question confirmed. What happened in Pawtucket, Rassel demanded. The teacher gasped, then changed the subject. Rassel was on his own again. As the 1850 Rhode Island winter dragged on so long, spring seemed nothing but a wish. Widow Tucker expected the April rains would bring, bring back the curious and thoughtful little boy next door eventually. It came as no shock that all the children in Smithfield thought her a witch. The surprise was that one of them living next door would pierce through all that somehow. So after her short visit from Marcellus, Widow Tucker began to prepare for his return, digging back a quarter century to her final days in Pawtucket in summer 1824 when she became a widow. Age was now a barrier. Widow Tucker hadn't thought of that box in a long time where she kept hidden away all trace of the love of her life in the tiny house's attic she hadn't climbed up to in years. Rickety old knees struggled onto each rung of the stepladder. Reaching into the loft was an exercise in hope, groping around in the dark to identify that box by feel. Dust fell onto her as she dragged it down the ladder, slowly, carefully. The dirty box on the floor, she sat back into the rocking chair before it and sighed. Pausing to remember their love, she pried open the box, and on top inside was a banner she tenderly unfurled for the first time in 26 years. Down with the lords of lash and loom, screamed out from the mist of time once more from the banner, and Widow Tucker smiled, casting her mind back. So, we're going to break there. Uh, no one in the American left knows about the Pawtucket textile strike of 1824. It is the first industrial action documented, known to have occurred in the United States. Uh, first strike of any kind. And um, in Rhode Island, Widow Tucker exists on a map of the Maori homestead in Smithfield from 1852. It just says Widow Tucker on the map. I don't know who Widow Tucker was. No one knows who Widow Tucker was. But if you're going to write a historical fiction series where they left this bent to try and uh, put capitalism at the heart of the Civil War, uh, which was largely won by the charge of the first Minnesota at Gettysburg, um, you have to go and find out about, and one of your soldiers in that charge is from Rhode Island, Smithfield, uh, you're going to learn about the Pawtucket textile strike. So here we go. Back to the book. Slater Mill in Pawtucket in May 1824 teamed with little children and young women loading slave harvested cotton into the looms. Again, no, pr no labor price in that cotton. Business boomed as every mill in Rhode Island bustled to spin Negro cloth to sell back to southern plantation owners the, claws, the clothes their slaves wore made from the cotton they picked. Capital's sick, inexorable logic folding upon itself like a snake eating its own tail. Power looms had become too big for the children over the years, so by 1824, desperately poor young women like the newly wed Mrs. Tucker joined the children in the mill at a wage so meager her new husband had to grow carrots in their plot, send ten chickens, even collect dandelion greens just to feed his new bride. The May Day, the mill announced yet another pay cut and yet longer hours, the young Mrs. Tucker's co-workers would not abide. They'd had enough. When Mrs. Tucker returned home from the mill to tell her husband the women called a, quote, turnout, which is what a strike was called back then, and why, Mr. Tuck, Mr. Tucker beamed with pride that night creating this banner for his wife to march with, down with the lords of Lash and Loom, scrawling her anger onto the Negro cloth that stoked it. Across Pawtucket, the women marched for weeks, 
the turnout spread across Rhode Island. Strikers attacking mill owners' homes, owners fighting back until a mill was burned to the ground. A compromise was somehow forged after the fire, and the mills reopened. Mr. and Mrs. Tucker were suddenly heroes in Pawtucket. The mill owners resolved none of it would ever happen again. Her husband's body was found covered in flies on a roadside one morning that summer, just one message of retribution meted out with targeted, relentless, permanent precision across Rhode Island. There would be no more textile strikes. Mrs. Now Widow Tucker, blacklisted into total poverty that December, gave birth to his child, who died within hours because her mother had been starving for months by then. She was now viewed as cursed in Pawtucket, ostracized. Somehow, she managed to land in the dilapidated house on the Maori homestead in Smithfield, far enough away from Pawtucket that her status as a childless widow would yield just enough pity with no questions asked. The Pawtucket textile strike faded behind her, settling into years spent scraping sustenance from her charity-granted plot, nights spent rocking in that chair to rest. Each passing year, she hoped ever more fervently it would be her last— as quiet exile engulfed her and children conjured her into a witch. Now, suddenly, she wanted to live again. After all, a curious little boy would visit soon. She was sure of it, and he needed to know. So the box was emptied, her husband resurrected, the memories displayed lovingly on every corner of her house, the banner unfurled again, saying again, down with the lords of lash and loom. Life returning to her soul, Widow Tucker's winter bed felt more cozy than usual that night, under an extra quilt. Sinking into her pillow, for the first time in years, she forgot to beg the Lord to take her before waking up. So we placed the Pawtucket textile strike into the story through Widow Tucker. And here's what happens. A strange sort of funeral in Smithfield. Rosellus did not return to Widow Tucker's house until the day, ten years later, he came to empty her home after she died. By 1860, the town had surrounded Little Rassel's interest in Widow Tucker the way white blood cells identify a viral threat, swarming the boy for ten years until he was a young man with a fog of total silence. Everywhere Little Rassel turned to learn about what happened to Widow Tucker in Pawtucket morphed into a brick wall. Fear gripped the boy such that Widow Tucker's home was now more terrifying than when he thought she was a witch. The silent swarm even changed the Maori Christmas. No more pies sent next door. Rassel didn't dare go back. As Rassel grew up on the Maori farm, distance calcified between him and the rest of the Maori family, especially his father, Zeba Jr., the fossilized throwback most determined to keep Rassel away from that witch. Withdrawn, quiet, bookish, Rosellus kept himself excelling at math with hopes to be an engineer designing roads like those he'd built stone walls along with his father. Rassel's interest in Widow Tucker's story faded so far back into his mind, the house next door was nearly invisible on his walks to school. Once in a while, he resumed his quest, especially when he became old enough to go to the local taverns in Greenville, Greenville, where scuttlebutt could be had once everyone was liquored up enough. There he learned a bit about the Pawtucket textile strike the safe late-night drunken version, only whispered across empty whiskey bottles. Shame gripped Rosellas for failing to visit Widow Tucker, so he'd get drunker. Then his morning hangover would settle the exile instinct back onto his soul. Exile has a way of enforcing itself through nameless fright. No one even knew she died until another generation of kids thinking her a witch caught a whiff of whatever was rotting inside. The local undertaker never worked faster in his life, leaving the windows open so whatever was in there could get out before anyone else came in. One day that summer of 1860, Rassel's mother quietly suggested he go clean the house out for a new tenant. I'll send your father to help, she said, never looking Rassel in the eye. Rassel knew what that meant, so finally returned to Widow Tucker's house quickly in order to beat his father there. Down with the lords of lash and loom was the first thing he saw opening the front door, the 36-year-old banner hanging there where Widow Tucker had pinned it 10 years ago, cobwebs now dangling off of it. Still exuding the faint, hovering stench of death all around the tiny house were the contents of her secret little box of memories, papers, mementos, bits of Negro cloth, a notebook, all more haunting than any witch Rassel had ever conjured her into as a child. Then there was the doll. Rassel stepped toward a hand-sewn little bear, nestled into the corner of a chair, with a note lovingly pinned to it. He picked it up, hands trembling to read the note. 
sewn from Negro cloth for my daughter who passed away at birth. Russell then knew she had created a museum while waiting for him to return all these 10 years to tell the little boy next door her story. Frozen in disgust with himself, Russell broke down in tears, surveying the room of documents and holy relics left to him and him alone when he was a child. Papa marched in, determined, his eyes hawkish like evil. It happened in the blink of Russell's tears. Stepping right past his weeping son holding a teddy bear, Papa ripped the banner from the wall, and Russell ended his relationship with his father with one punch. A roundhouse right hook, right hook flew so fast from Russell's torment, it knocked his father flat, crashing him through a table, Widow Tucker's memories flying in all directions. Russell straddled across his prostrate father lying in his, on his back to stare down at Papa's loose tooth and the blood filling his throat. Russell's glare daring to him to get up. Get up, you fucking coward. Thus, Zeba Maori Jr., Jr. on his back from the floor watched his son leave him forever, towering over him motionless, breathing heavy, a teddy bear clutched in his left hand, a fist still in his right, the wrath of history in his dead, tearful eyes. You will clean this house yourself, Russell said softly, then stepped over his father on the floor, tossing the teddy, teddy bear back at him through the open front door. In the short walk home, Rosellus Maori resolved that moment to get the hell out of Rhode Island forever as fast as he could. By next summer, he would be in St. Paul, enlisted in Company A of the 1st Minnesota Volunteer Infantry. So that's our uh, quick read of Volume 1, beginning Chapter 4. We are now going to go on to Chapter uh, Volume 2, where we uh, rejoin Rosellus Maori a couple years later in Uniontown, where he is with the 1st Minnesota Regiment, uh, resting. Um, by the way, uh, Jonathan, my co-host on the Ghost of Plum Run Hour, our little podcast or Midwestern Marks podcast, whenever we do them, um, he and I both agree that MGK kind of should play Rosellus Maori because he punches his father, which would look great in rotoscope animation for our rotoscope animator who may be listening. Um, anyway, chapter eight, Agreeable Rest from volume two, Serpents and Dust. Oh, and by the way, Dust is the metaphor for capitalism. I was hoping for somebody to figure that out and point it out, but dust is the metaphor. Anyway, here we go. Pawing at the ground in front of the Babylon farm, the cat waited for Private Macellus Maori, his hands in his pockets, shuffling toward the road. Another rain shower brewed above. Around the cat, the greatest traffic jam in Uniontown's history, choked the road with wagons, horses, ladies with baskets, curious kids, peddlers, musicians, holy men, blessing the farm from the road. The traffic snaking the mile west toward town. A carnival atmosphere bustled. The snores of thousands of men in tents rumbled around Rosellus Maori as he walked from Company A's camp through the carpet of the Second Corps' afternoon naps well underway. Unable to sleep, his head down, brooding, Maori nearly kicked the cat in the road. The cat didn't mind. Where have you been, little fellow? Maori said to the cat, bending to pick it up. But the cat did not wish to be picked up, so it scurried through the crowd down the road. Maori followed, bumping into and off of the traffic. A Union soldier, no longer such a novelty as it was last night. The most notable thing about Uniontown to Maori last night, upon arrival, was the number of whiskey jugs that kept being passed into the regiment from porches. Now, a few gentlemen offered kind words, some ladies waved hankies, but this afternoon, Maori was like a player in a circus tent everyone had seen already, wandering the midway on his lunch break. So it was Maori who was curious about the town, deciding to take a look. The cat got a few paces ahead, then waited, making sure Maori didn't get lost in the crowd. Maori would lose sight of the cat briefly among the bustle, peering this way and that for it. Oh, there it is. The walk continued. It was a longer walk than last night. Much longer. A bend in the road approached more slowly than Maori rem remembered it. The cat disappeared around the bend, so Maori sped his walk, looked around the bend, and there the cat was, licking its paws, waiting in the traffic. A drizzle began to fall. Off the cat went again, up a rise and over it, vanishing again over the crest. Maori chased up the rise where once more the cat was waiting. He chuckled to himself about this silly cat and his own silly habit of getting wrapped up in whatever cat might be hanging around. <clears throat> they played this game, Maori and the stray cat, all the way into town, which seems very far away indeed. He looked back east down the road at the top of another rolling rise to gauge how far he'd gone. Nothing but the circus of traffic. He turned again in the drizzle, continuing toward town. Where was this town? It wasn't this far away last night, was it? Drizzle turned to steady rain, but the cat didn't seem bothered. Aren't cats supposed to hate getting wet? 
Mari had never heard of a cat that didn't mind rain. Ahead of him, the cat just strolled along, much further away than before. Mar- Maybe above was one of those strange clouds that rained over here but not over there. Maybe this crowd in the road kept the cat dry underneath them. It was just then Maori noticed there wasn't a crowd in the road anymore. He gazed around in the rain. Where'd everyone go? He turned west to see the cat in the middle of the road, alone. The rain felt heavy on him, then heavier. Maori began to run toward the cat, never seeming to get closer. The cat wasn't wet. Snow seemed to stick to the cat, its paws kicking it up off the road, like dust, but like snow. He felt his body shrink. Something was wrong. The weight of the rain on him became a burden, slowing his run. Maori didn't feel wet, just wait. He ran and ran until he saw the town, a house with a porch. Pressing into him, the weight seemed to shrink him more and more until he could carry on no longer. He fell, rolling under the incredible flattening weight, sinking him into the ground like under beams of iron, rain snow piles under them. His face squeezed between the weight and the ground. Maori saw the cat walk away. Suddenly it was quiet. The weight eased. Around him all was gray. The rain snow softened and became fluffy, piling up. Things felt cozy. Rosellus felt smaller, a boy again. The dusty piles felt billowed on him like his mother's down quilt, so he curled up in them, peering out from under to see the leaves falling from the trees. It was autumn, or winter, or in between. Something bothered him. So we're going to pause here and talk about uh, a little call out to a scene from a, one of the earliest p- uh, films uh, ever made uh, by Alice Guy Blaché, uh, a French woman who uh, is the first female cinematographer, movie maker, director, producer, camera woman ever from France, from Paris. Um, Alice Guy Blaché, one of her most famous, uh, most in- influential movies, one of the very first movies that had a story arc of any kind, uh, is a little girl uh, trying to put leaves back on trees because the leaves are falling. And um, her sister is sick, and the little girl thinks that by putting leaves back on the trees, uh, it may push back time, and then her sister won't be sick anymore. We uh, do a little call out here in Ghosts of Plum Run, uh, Chapter 8 to Alice Guy Blaché, as follows. Leaves were falling. In, oh, sorry, in Marcellus Maori's dream where he goes back to being eight years old and meets Widow Tucker again. Here we go. Something bothered him. Leaves were falling. They mustn't yet. So Marcellus crawled out from under the pile to catch a leaf as it fell to the ground. A string was in his other hand. He reached to a branch, then tied the leaf back onto it. He stepped back to blow on it to make sure the knot was tight. Then he caught more leaves as they fell, tying them back to the tree, one by one. It was working. In the gray, out there somewhere, a black silhouette appeared, strolling in from the fog, a woman in a dress and a big hat. Rosellus ran from the tree, happy he'd stopped time and reversed it by tying leaves back onto trees. So clever I am, he thought. So he nestled back into the dust and sat up to look. Was it really her? So very good to see you, Rosellus, she said. It was her, Widow Tucker. She took a seat on her knees and the ground next to the cozy dust pile. She reached out to tenderly brush his hair back. He smiled, closed his eyes, and felt proud of himself. Where are we, he asked. We're in Uniontown, silly boy, Widow Tucker said. What's Uniontown, he asked. Widow Tucker laughed at the boy's confusion because Private Maori was a boy again at age eight. Thank you for coming to visit today, Widow Tucker said. He began to cry. I'm so sorry. There, there. Please forgive me, Rosellus cried. Let's get some of this off of you so we can have a little chat. She brushed at the little boy, fluffy dust balls rolling off of him. There, that's better. I meant to come back. I really did. Now, now, young man, you never left. I didn't. You've been with me this whole time, and I've been with you. Little Rosellus understood. I'm still sorry, the boy said again. Widow Tucker laughed. Well, let's get get to that, shall we? Get to what? You see, Widow Tucker said, all this dust... It was raining before, then snow. Is it dust now? Rosellus asked. You see how light it is, like a feather? And she picked up a clump, blew it from her fingertips, and they both watched it floating away. Little Rosellus was delighted. It's so comfortable to lie in, like mother's quilt. Indeed it is. Too comfortable. She floated Rosellus. She she floated. Rosellus watched her ascend into the gray sky of dust, then 
lengthen, then coil, then her face became hideous, her jaw opening to unsheathed fangs, stretching out, drool dripping from the razor-sharp gleaming points, then a growl screamed out of her. She was a serpent now, above him in the sky. The serpent vomited an ocean of dust onto him, but Rosellus was not afraid, not in the least. Come back, Widow Tucker, he asked upward, very politely, shooing dust from his eyes. I don't like you this way. And so she did return, floating back down to sit with him again, brushing the dust off his shoulders once more. You see, she said, tidying the boy, we just have to keep the dust away, don't we? Keep it in its place. We do, Rosellus agreed. I miss you, Widow Tucker. Now I have something to tell you. Your father is very sorry and has a surprise for you. Rosellus beamed. He does? Indeed, he's very sorry like you. It makes him very sad what he did. It's all right to be sad, Rosellus said. She stood up, brushed herself off, and Rosellus began to cry again. Please don't go. I'm always here, she said. Things went black. Millie! Millie! Private Maori screamed alone on the ground in his tent. Not now, Maori. Not now, you damn shit-ass fool, Corporal Marks muttered to himself, marching past Private Russell, Privates Muller and Fager, who'd just been awakened from their afternoon nap by Private Maori screaming himself out of a nightmare. What took you so long, Fager joked as Marks raced by, hobbling like an old man on his aching feet. We are not doing this now, Maori, Marks shouted as he ripped open their tent to find Maori sitting up, horrified. Something awful has happened to Millie, Maori said from his knees to Marks in the tent flap. You just had a nightmare, Mark said. Forget it all. Calm down. No, no, you have to believe me. Don't make me pull rank on you, Private. Maori caught his breath, looking around the tent. The dream was over. Widow Tucker gone. No more dust. No more cat. Embarrassed, he tumbled back, catching himself. What a dream, Maori said, panting for breath. You were really going to pull rank on me, weren't you? Don't do this, Rosellus. Maori rubbed his face to make, wake himself up. Just read your mail, for God's sake. Mark's tough with frustration. I told you, I've heard nothing of Millie, and it is not my fault. You are waking up this entire company, screaming her name in your sleep. Maori collected himself, then stepped out of the tent past Mark's, stood up straight, everyone within earshot, staring at the two of them. Then Maori finally let it out. She never loved you. What the? Private, do not do this. Two tents down, Muller and Fager shook their heads. They'd seen this all before. Great time for all that to boil over, Fager said. Many dreams boiled over among the 11,000 men napping that afternoon on the Babylon farm in Uniontown. So exhausted they were from their 33-mile march, the entire corps slept the deepest of sleep last night. And nearly all the next day. The town's whiskey helped dreams along. Yanks cannot handle their liquor, Muller said to Fager. This town keeps bringing more, Fager laughed. The company captain, Henry Coates, as was his habit, hurried up to see what was afoot. Another nightmare? Coates asked Fager and Muller. They nodded up at Coates. I just came from someone screaming about his dog. This one's old news, Muller replied. Millie again? Coates asked. Good Lord, the argument two tents down heated up. Everyone's having strange dreams, Marks said again to Maori. Their staring contest began. I had one myself. Just forget it and relax. <clears throat> I bet you had a dream. I can only imagine what that was about. Oh, can you? <clears throat> if I was in uniform, I'd walk you to the back of this farm. If I wasn't in uniform, I'd walk you to the back of this farm and get my satisfaction, Maori said. Marks laughed heartily. I'll give you all the satisfaction you want. You're going to regret this, Maori. She never loved you, and you want to punish me for that by never reading her letters, Maori insisted. Marks snapped. If she loved you, why aren't you getting letters from her? They glared at each other. Just slips her mind, does it? God damn you, Maori sped out, leaping at Marks to begin their brawl among the tents. They rolled around, flailing at each other as Coates rushed in to break, the, break it up. Fager and Muller shaking their heads, staying out of it. Enough, Coates shouted, pulling them apart, both tumbling away. They sat on the ground. We aren't in St. Paul, boys, Coates said sternly. Now come to attention, both of you. Marks and Maori refused, staying petulant. Attention, corporal, private. They got up. Coates turned to Marks, sneering. Weren't you supposed to be resting your aching feet for this officer's reception tonight, Corporal? Yes, sir, Marks replied. Coates turned to Maori. And you, do you honestly believe you could get your satisfaction from the Corporal? Coates asked Maori. He would have your throat split open with one wave of his knife, and you know that, Private. Marks said, Marks and Maori smiled at each other, finally. Yes, sir, he would. Apologies, sir, Maori answered. Get a hold of yourselves, boys, Coates begged. At ease, Christ. It was over. 
Marks and Maury sat back down at the front of the tent, slightly ashamed, yet knowing this episode was fairly tame compared to what it could have been. Coach shuffled past Fager and Muller, both hiding their amusement. Maury and Marks huffed and puffed a bit at the mouth of the tent. Look, Marks said, you have to believe me. She doesn't send letters, Marks said this time, with love. How many times did I scream her name, Maury asked, embarrassed by it all. Plenty to be heard, Mark said, and a plenty to wake me up. They both stared at the ground at the front of their tent. Why don't you read those letters, Maury asked softly. Not important, Mark said sadly. Who are they from, Maury asked tentatively, knowing Marks didn't want to answer. Marks thought, looked up at the clouds, heaved a sigh, then looking into Maury's curious eyes said, If I tell you, will you stop thinking they're from Millie? Marks replied. Maury knew then he'd crossed the boundary Marks didn't want crossed and backed away from the topic with a long silence, shaking his head. I'm sorry, it's not my business, Maury said. Do you want the purple hanky, Marks joked, breaking the tension. I don't even remember the dream, Maury said. It's yours if it'll help, Marks insisted, smiling. You can wear it in battle if you like. Maury laughed it all off. I don't know why she was even in the dream, or if. Dreams are like that, said Marks. I had to get out of the tent. I walked a bit, but you got louder and louder. So the whole company heard me? Marks chuckled. Most of them. Figured I ought to do something about it before you scared the entire corps. What was your dream like? Maury asked. Did we both have dreams about her? I can't say, Marks replied, scratching in the dirt. I don't quite remember my dream either. Maybe I didn't even have a dream. Everyone's just so exhausted. It's gone, Maury said amazed. Just like that. Someone said this farm might be haunted. Marks just shook his head in a pause between the two friends, settling them both down. Things appearing calmer, Muller left Fager at their tent to approach the would-be duelers with a jug. Lager, Muller offered. Marks grabbed the jug and downed a gulp. Germans in this town, Murray asked, happy the subject had changed. Enough of them, Muller replied. Muller had long ago had, be- had long ago had become accustomed to changing the subject between Mar- Marks and Maori. While the corporal here is at the ball tonight, some of this town will be cooking for us in camp. Marks passed the jug to Maori. Muller looked behind him. In fact, here they come now. They stared in awe. Before them, Toby led a wagon load of food and jugs into the camp, escorted by a crowd of burly-looking fellows prepared to welcome the Second Corps properly. Fighting up North Shore is different, Toby shouted ahead. Maori turned to Marks in astonishment. This town may kill us before Lee does, Maori said, then gulped from the lager jug. Guten Abend, the townsmen shouted in German. That was all Muller and Fager needed to hear. Boisterous, welcoming hugs erupted. Corporal, these men are here to prepare you for the officer's reception, Muller said to Marks, who stood up and took a deep breath. Seems they've arrived early. Good thing we're German, Marks replied in German. Toby bounced up to Marks. They're cooking till the food's gone, sir, Toby laughed, and Uniontown's welcome carried onward. Normally, Company A's camp, or any Union Army camp, was a dreary affair, numbing mundane boredom broken only by drill or duty or digging a latrine trench or more drilling, Months would go by, surviving on nothing but the dry rock, solid hardtack passing for bread in their haversacks and coffee. Occasionally, they'd forage up a chicken or a pig. A stench of filthy men, their horses and mules, the latrines, always hovered like a thick ooze. On a march, camp life's miseries were multiplied by constant putting up and taking down. But by late afternoon, June 30th, 1863, camp in Uniontown would forever stand out to every veteran of the first Minnesota as living on the, quote, top shelf. Muller and Fager took it, took to it like fishes to the sea. Go wake up Henry, Muller shouted in German to Fager, who was already racing to find Private Henry Nickel, Muller's uncle. The trio of Muller, his uncle Henry, and Jacob Fager were Company A's German family corps, so if there was an occasion to be joined, especially a German one, they'd be in the center of it. Seven years younger than Muller, Henry's relation as uncle to Muller confused their superiors endlessly. Strangely, Muller's grandmother had... Uh, an unexpected child very late in life back in Prussia. Muller always suspected some dashing soon-to-be revolutionary, like Peter Marx, one day swept his grandma off her feet, gave her one last great romance, which gave Muller a brand new uncle when Muller was just seven years old. The confusion delighted Charles and Henry as boys, then as immigrants in St. Paul, but most often as soldiers because officers couldn't figure it out. They're befuddled. He's younger than you. How's he your uncle? always fell like a good joke onto their ears. In no time, Fager had Uncle Henry on the scene, helping cook the German feast with the locals. This duty done, Fager approached Marks and Toby. Mrs. Hamburg sent these men, Fager said, after delivering Uncle Henry into their service. They all worked in her husband's hat shop as boys. 
They're all German? Marx asked. No, Fager chuckled. Just some. Mrs. Hamburg told them she heard German spoken here this morning, so that's what, what they prepared. Like the warmth of the sun, Marx felt his Deutschstum, his Germanness, well up within him as the commotion of a family gathering livened up camp all around. His aching feet were forgotten. His brief brawl with Maori was gone. His afternoon nap nightmare is not even a memory. Peter Marx, the perfect little Prussian prince he tried to leave behind so many times, was being dragged out of him by the relentless love of strangers in America again. Marx turned to Toby, who merely stood with a smile, himself in disbelief, at his Union Down day so far. Toby, I must ask you something, Marx said. Yes, sir. Do you think I'll make it to the ball? Marx half-joked. Oh, these folks make it sure of that, sir, Toby laughed. You'll be there. Wag wagons running into town and back like a train. One of the hat shop boys approached from the meal wagon. Cigars, he offered. Compliments of Mrs. Hamburg. Don't mind if I do, Marx replied, taking two, handing one to Toby. All you boys worked at that hat shop? Over the years, yes, the hat shop boy said. Keller and Hamburg hats raise many of our families. The missus is at the hotel making preparations. General Hancock will be having dinner there before the ball. Is Hancock getting German sausages too? Marx asked. Oh no, the hat shop boy replied. I think they're having steaks. <clears throat> I see, Marx said with a puff of the cigar. I think perhaps we've gotten the better of the menu. Corporal Peter Marx thus settled into Company A's final hours in Uniontown. Across the Babylon farm, afternoon slumber gave way to an evening of telling tall tales around the finest meals any Second Corps soldier had enjoyed since enlisting. Officers prepared themselves to be received at the Segaf Segafus Hotel, while around them every sort of revelry slowly gathered steam. The usual awful smell of camp was overwhelmed with the aroma of food over every fire. As the sun began to set, None in the first Minnesota could know that at this very hour, in two days, this night's memory would be blotted out of them forever by the hand of fate, blurred by a hell none could imagine enduring. Their rest in Uniontown would be nothing but a prelude, a stop on the march to eternity. And if Uniontown was remembered at all, only a hazy, fond notion of living briefly on the, quote, top shelf would remind them of their life before, before Gettysburg. Campfires crackling across the Babylon farm, Company A's Germans, fed to bursting, lounged around the campfire with their jugs of Uniontown's lager in their laps. A makeshift trio of accordion player, a banjo, and a fiddler filled the air with song. Muller called them the Hat Shop Boys. Fager, on harmonica, insisted teaching the Hat Shop Boys how to play La Marseillaise. Satisfied with their rehearsal, Muller turned his attention to Corporal Marx, who had fallen asleep near the fire, sausages and pies having done their work. Who's getting him in the wagon to the hotel? Muller asked the gathered circle of new friends, his jug resting on him in a chair brought to camp from town. One of Mrs. Hamburg's former hat shop boys leapt to his feet. It shall be done, the man said. You fellas seem to know each other from back home. St. Paul is a small place, Fager answered, then had a notion. Hold on, where's Maori? Muller understood, interrupting the hat shop boy. Private Mau Maori should wake him, Muller declared. Henry, he hinted at his uncle, who was off to find Maori in his tent, writing a letter by the light of, the, of a lantern. The most popular soldierly activity of the Second Corps that day was writing letters home in between sleeping and being showered with food and drink. Uniontown's post office was buried in boxes and crates loaded with outgoing mail for days, written by the thousands. Come wake Marks for the ball, Uncle Henry said into the tent. Interrupted, Maori tossed his pencil down. Damn you, Nickel, haven't the two of us entertained you boys enough today, Maori said. Marching out of the tent. Maori shouted Muller from behind the jug on his lap as Maori emerged from his tent. The corporal has somewhere to be. All were giggling except Maori. Is Maori German too? asked the hat shop boy. No, Muller explained. Just these two fellas just have some history. That's all. Attention, corporal, Maori shouted. Smacking marks on the back of his head who groggily snapped awake to see his comrades laughing. They made me do it, Maori said, walking back to his tent. The ladies of this town await you at the Segafus, our town's finest hotel, sir, a hat shop boy shouted over the laughter. Marx rose, swaying a bit, gathering his balance. Where's Coates, Marx asked. Already there, Muller answered. Took a taxi up the road with Colonel Colville. Maori, there's no lager in that tent. I'm finishing a letter. I'll be back, Maori shouted back. Colonel Adams let Colville go to the dance, Marx asked. Marx asked. Special parole, Muller laughed. You're the only officer of the regiment still here. Boys, we should give him a worthy send-off. Muller tried to stand, but... Couldn't quite yet, thinking better of it, so he plopped back down. These town folk will take care of it, Muller decided, which they did, walking Marx to his tent to adorn him in his dress uniform finery, at least whatever finery was left after a 33-mile march in them. 
finding determination, the boozy haze lifted from Mark's just enough to notice Maori's letter writing by the lantern light. Writing Millie? Marks asked mischievously. Unhappy with the letter he was about to finish, Maori balled it up and tossed it, starting fresh. None of your business, Maori replied from the fl- dirt floor. Plenty of ladies for you to worry about at the ball, I'm quite sure, Marks chuckled. So there are, Mark said, straightening, primping his uniform, popping his cap onto his head. Boys, he shouted out of the tent, I am ready to be escorted. He swung open the tent flap and marched out into the gathered Germans of Company A, serenaded by the hat shop boys who had just learned La Marseillaise amid a choir of hoisted jugs. Allons enfants de la patrie, le jour de gloire est arrivé. Uh, there it goes. La Marseillaise. Perfect Prussian Prince Peter, Corporal Peter Marx was thus escorted through Company A's camp to the road. On the floor behind him in the tent, Maori shook his head laughing and began his letter again. My dearest Alice, we marched more than 30 miles yesterday to a place called Uniontown, where our day's rest is most agreeable. How's Button? Now, that's it. You may remember Button as the cat that uh, met uh, Rosellus Maori and brought uh, Alice and Maori together when he was on his exile tent at the back of the farm after having punched his dad out. Uh, we are hoping MGK will play uh, the uh, dad punching son. Um, uh, others may arise as we go forward. But uh, thank you for listening. This is, if you've gotten this far, uh, we, are, uh, we, we read that extended excerpt with uh, some from volume one and some from volume two because of Eddie Liger Smith's article at MidwesternMarks.com, American Slavery and Global Capitalism. Uh, to highlight just how far into a society no labor cost cotton had drilled itself uh, into the United States pre-Civil War. Uh, Again, I'm Tim Russo, author of the Star Wars series for leftists, Ghosts of Plum Run. Thank you for listening. Hope to see you next time.